welcome to my channel. My name is Lisa Alistway and I create inspirational and informational videos you can use and apply to your life. Today's guest is Dr. Demetrius Pearson, who is an associate professor at the University of Houston. Dr. Pearson has conducted research and written about African American involvement in various sport forms, including the North American rodeo as well as their depiction in contemporary sport films. Dr. Pearson recently contributed to the book, Black Cowboys in the American West, On the Range, On the Stage, Behind the Badge, which won the Ray and Pat Brown Award for Best Edited Collection in Popular Culture and American Culture. He also wrote chapter six of the book titled, Shadow Riders of the Subterranean Circuit, a descriptive account of Black rodeo in the Texas Gulf Coast region. His latest book, Black Rodeo in the Gulf Coast Region, Charcoal in the Ashes, was released in May of 2021. Welcome, Dr. Pearson. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here and a pleasure to, pleasure to um, visit with you. Great. So my first question is, why the study of Black cowboys? Well, the, the study of black cowboys is vitally necessary because all too often they have been omitted from uh, American history and, and, and certainly Western history. They, their, their role has been marginalized, even though they have been intimately involved in the livestock management business in the United States and particularly in the state of Texas. They were involved in livestock management, meaning um, ranching and, 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 and um, cattle um, involvement before Texas became a republic. Actually, they were involved in um, livestock management when um, Mexico actually owned the area of Texas, which some refer to as Spanish Texas. They were among the original cowboys, if you will, that settled in Texas through the George Ranch. The George Ranch, which is out in Richmond, Texas, is the oldest ranch in Texas. It was purchased by uh, Moses Austin, the father of Stephen F. Austin. And Stephen F. Austin helped to colonize um, the, what is now known as the George Ranch. It was also called Austin's Colony early on, but they purchased uh, parcels of land from the Mexican government. Um, unbeknownst to many, um, slavery had been abolished in Mexico. However, um, Stephen Austin and um, the colonists brought slaves to Texas and they worked these um, plantations, if you will, um, they would be known as ranches more often than not after the Civil War and after the Emancipation Proclamation, many of these plantations kind of dropped that uh, title and became ranches. But in many respects, they, they were plantations. And uh, Black cowboys worked on these ranches, not only um, on the George Ranch, but many other ranches in the state of Texas and through various parts of um, the United States. Um, the George Ranch is um, seminal for many reasons because it was one of the largest ranches um, in the state of Texas. Um, obviously, people will um, draw on the King Ranch, mm -hmm. which is um, south of yep. um, us and became Kingsville. But the George Ranch is still a working ranch. Mm -hmm. And uh, the legacy of Black cowboys um, goes back to, as I mentioned, um, its settlement. But the records of the George Ranch prior to the 20th century, their, their records indicate that at one point, the vast majority of the working cowboys on the ranch were Black cowboys. Mm -hmm. Um, so they have a long legacy. And in the area of Richmond, um, which is one of the um, best areas to graze and to grow crops, um, they were intimately involved. As a matter of fact, 
um, I recently went to an induction ceremony for a black rodeo cowboy who is a descendant of these individuals who worked the George Ranch. As a matter of fact, his mother was the cook and maid at the George Ranch for somewhere around 45 years. And he was born on the George Ranch. His name is Willie Thomas. And Willie Thomas, uh, until last year, he is deceased, lived in Booth, Texas, which is right down the road from the George Ranch. He was inducted posthumously into the Bull Riders Hall of Fame. And I felt it um, an obligation to go to the Bull Riders Hall of Fame, which is in Fort Worth, Texas, um, because I helped write his induction ceremony speech and, and the uh, document that um, individuals had to vote on. Uh, as a matter of fact, if I can show you a screen, um, I'll, I'll share a screen with you that um, okay. highlights. What we saw. Oh, fantastic. Uh, actually, this is um, Willie Tom. Oh, excuse me. Willie Thomas, among the other class of 2021 inductees. Um, this was a very prestigious group of individuals going into the Hall of Fame. Mm -hmm. and, and what's um, very important about um, Willie Thomas is that um, he started rodeoing in 1948. This is at or around the time that Jackie Robinson broke into the major leagues. Okay. And unlike Jackie Robinson, who had a team that sometimes would go to bat for him during a time in which um, racism and discriminatory practices were actually sanctioned in many um, areas, uh, Willie Thomas went alone. So at times, you know, he could not get into hotels. He could not um, actually receive his payment for having placed in a rodeo because he was not allowed to go into um, the pay room and actually pick up his um, monies. So mm -hmm. it's um, really interesting um, to talk about his involvement in rodeo because he actually mentored many of the individuals who are among the best in the world as we speak. Um, he mentored Murtis Dykeman, who was the first African-American cowboy who placed in the national finals. The national finals is held each year in Las Vegas. It is what many consider the Super Bowl of rodeos. Mm -hmm. um, He's actually participated in the Houston Livestock Show and Rodeo, which is the largest rodeo in the world, mm -hmm. um, a 21-day rodeo. As a matter of fact, um, NRG, formerly Reliance Stadium, would not have been built without the assistance of the Houston Livestock Show and Rodeo. Mm -hmm. um, on your screen is uh, the book cover of the forthcoming book, Black Rodeo in the Texas Gulf Coast region, charcoal in the ashes. And the individual um, who was on the top there is Willie Thomas. The um, bull rider at the bottom of the screen is Murtis Dykeman, who some refer to as the Jackie Robinson of rodeo because he's the one that got the initial fame and uh, celebrity status. But interestingly enough, Willie Thomas is the individual who put Murtis Dykeman on his first bull and actually got him started. So if you know, we, we consider um, the individual who was the first one out there, it would be someone like um, Willie Thomas during the modern age. Mm -hmm. You mentioned to me, um, I'm gonna pull this off. You mentioned um, individuals like Bill Pickett Mm -hmm. and um, others. Uh, Bill Pickett was the first of the rodeo cowboys. We're talking about someone who was rodeoing uh, around the turn of the century and actually mm -hmm. was involved in Buffalo Bill's Wild West shows yes. um, during the turn of the century. Um, he is um, the only 
individual who created a rodeo event. Uh, bulldogging or steer wrestling is a creation of Bill Pickett. Mm -hmm. And he had an interesting way in which he um, brought the uh, steer down. Mm -hmm. He actually bit the steer on the ear and turned him over, which is mm -hmm. um, interesting to say the least. Yes. <laughs> uh, nowadays, certainly individuals are not doing that. But um, as a result of his um, involvement in the rodeo pen and as a dirt and dust cowboy, some contend he was the best actual cowboy in terms of ranching mm -hmm. of all time. Mm -hmm. um, that's partly why he became the first African-American yeah. inducted into the Rodeo Hall of Fame, which is um, in Oklahoma City, as well as the Rodeo Hall of Fame in Colorado Springs, Colorado. Yes. Um, interestingly enough, there's a, a, another individual that we would be remiss if we didn't talk about, because uh, every time I mention this fellow's name, it conjures up how good some of these individuals were, but mm -hmm. were not able to compete with mm -hmm. their white counterparts. Jesse Stahl was a bareback rider and, and was a very good one. And, and one who oftentimes would have won if there wasn't bias and jaundiced uh, judging. Um, and on several occasions, one in particular, he felt that he was robbed of first place, and I think he got a second or third place. So the next bull, or pardon me, the next uh, bronc, he took out of the chute, he rode him backwards with a cigar oh in his mouth, okay? <laughs> Just to let the judges know that he was far better than any of his counterparts. Mm -hmm. um, on another occasion, he did something very similar to this, but added a little bit more to it, much like Bobby Riggs um, in tennis. But um, Jesse Stahl came out of the shoot, this time riding a, a, a bronc backwards with the cigar in his mouth with a suitcase in hand. A suitcase? A suitcase. <laughs> Just to let folks know how good he was, he also has been inducted into the Pro Rodeo Hall of Fame. Um, these are but a few of the individuals who have um, been involved in this early American sport form, which ironically enough was, according to many, the first integrated sport form in America. Integrated but not inclusive. Mm. And I say that because even in the Buffalo Bill Wild West shows, they yeah. had Native Americans participating in various uh, activities, certainly white cowboys and, and doing certain things. And they had Bill Pickett, but they were not able to live and stay in the same environment. Mm -hmm. So. They were a part of the Wild West shows, but secluded from mm -hmm. actual um, living arrangements and, and other kinds of things that we uh, now take for granted. And yeah. we would see that um, over the years as it relates to rodeo and particularly with um, Willie Thomas, who rodeoed at a time in which Major League Baseball was still not integrated. Mm -hmm. um, and he rodeoed from the 19, late 1940s up into the 1960s, um, mm -hmm. much like Negro League baseball players. Unfortunately, he was born ahead of his time, uh, at a time in which um, integration into the various sport forms was not the case for many African-American um, athletes. Mm -hmm. And um, when he did ride, and this was something that many um, black cowboys face during the, the 1950s, the 1960s, and into the early part of the 1970s where they would have what's called a slack. And slack is a rodeo before or after 
the regular rodeo where okay. you have spectators. Mm -hmm. This is a competition where um, during the 50s and, and, and during the 60s, black cowboys had the ride either before the spectators came in or many times after the spectators left the venue and they had basically a separate rodeo. And, and, and their scores would count if they uh, had high scores, but no one would have seen them ride, wow. which is really um, a travesty because mm -hmm. there were times where some of these individuals rode bulls that had never been ridden before. And, and bull riding is the uh, top event in, yes. in, in many um, rodeos. As a matter of fact, they will have bull riding at the beginning of a rodeo and at mm -hmm. the end because it is the draw. And right, nowadays right. you have the PBR, which is professional bull riding. That's yeah. all it is. Right. And, and, and these individuals, um, unfortunately, um, were cast, and, and this goes for steer wrestling, um, uh, calf roping. Uh, many of the um, events um, took place after the rodeo. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, after the fans left, let, let, let me say that. And um, it was really unfortunate that um, they were cast in this um, situation. So yeah. during the time in which I um, conducted this research, and this is over the last 20 years, and I continue to do it. Um, as a matter of fact, I'll be going to several rodeos in September now that um, things have opened up a bit. Yeah. Um, and, and, and people are, you know, still undertaking the requisite uh, protocols and the like. And it is the case even in a rodeo environment, which is outside, individuals are still masking up and, and maintaining the various protocols. Um, we will still see um, some of the vestiges of um, the old time rodeos where individuals can actually um, drive up to the rodeo pen and sit in the back of their pickups and, and watch the rodeo. Mm -hmm. um, the rodeo is now moving back out of the um, indoor venues and coming back to some of the outdoor venues, which are some of the major venues that um, have taken place over the years. Yeah. Um, can, can you talk a little bit about the discriminatory practices that uh, black cowboys experienced in the rodeo? I think I was reading about they were given like a tougher, you know, bronc to ride, for example. Well, sometimes they did, but ironically, a, a good bull rider wants the toughest bull because that's how they score. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, in the case of people like Willie Thomas and Murtis Dykeman, um, and, and, and Willie had said this to me uh, on numerous occasions when I interviewed him, is that there were times where he would get uh, an outstanding bull and, and people put considerable amounts of money in these bulls. They, they, they breed them to buck off individuals yes. and, and pay considerable amounts of money to cross breed them. Yeah. Willie would say from time to time that he would ride a bull basic to the point where the bull would just go down on, on, on all fours before the whistle would blow. And this is before they had the horns and this, that, and the other. And, and then all of a sudden the whistle would blow and, and, and he would be timed out. Um, some very unfair kinds of um, situations. Um, one individual mentioned who was um, a Hall of Fame cowboy when Murtis Eichmann uh, mentioned that for whatever reason, I just, you know, can't win. I, I keep getting second or third place, but I can't get the first place money. And, and one cowboy said, you know, and this was a white cowboy who was um, a, a friend of his. And, and the cowboy culture is an interesting culture in and of itself. And as an individual who um, does ethnographic research, which is looking at environments, cultures, and the individuals who, who make up these um, milieus. Um, the individual said, keep riding. One of the reasons uh, you know, why you're not you know, getting what you deserve is that you're not white. 
you know, so unless you can turn white, you know, it, it's not going to happen mm -hmm. until certain things change. And unfortunately, um, over time, he was respected. He made the national finals seven or eight times. And um, on, on one particular instance, he placed in the top three. So he's, he was third in the world. But yeah. going in, I mean, it's based on the monies you earn. And oftentimes he was not earning the top money. He was getting second place money, third place money, which made him have to ride in a lot of rodeos in order to be among the top 15 that are uh, able, or the top 10 that are able to place in the national finals. Um, interestingly enough, um, I, I, a friend of mine and a friend of Willie's who is still alive and actually went down the road with him uh, on several um, trips. And this was a trip that um, he and um, Willie Thomas and two other cowboys had um, taken to Madison Square Garden from, from Texas. And oftentimes they would be working with the um, uh, contractors, um, the um, cattle contractors in um, bringing the bulls in and the livestock in and actually competing in these rodeos. And, and from uh, Madison Square Garden, New York, they would also go to a rodeo in Boston. These were big, rodeos and the stock contractors would um, have these individuals with them. Well, they were going up and, and they were in the, the lower part of Ohio, which is somewhat different than Northern Ohio in terms of um, people's views, um, very conservative in many respects. And they had made reservations for um, a motel hotel and they had gotten to their destination. It was um, in the evening and um, they went to check in and the receptionist or person at the desk said, uh, we don't have any vacancies. What year was this? Um, this had to be was it in the times? Uh, late fifties, maybe early sixties, uh, probably in the late fifties. Okay. And um, they had made the reservations, but the uh, woman said, we don't have any vacancies. Okay. Now that's interesting because um, there wasn't a problem when we made the um, reservation. So one of the um, individuals went outside and, and the sign still said vacancies. Mm. So he came back in and said, oh, the sign says vacancies. And um, the woman said, well, we don't have any vacancies. So um, she got on the phone and, and called the sheriff. Um, shortly thereafter, the sheriff came in and said, hey, boys, um, what's the problem? Um, Willie Thomas and his um, fellow cowboys said, um, we made reservations. And um, they said they don't have any reservations or any vacancies for us. Um, so um, the um, sheriff said, well, fellas, um, I got a place for you. Uh, if you um, want to follow me, you can come down to the county jail and um, Skeet um, um, Gordon said, um, that's the best offer we've had all night. So they actually stayed in the jailhouse overnight <laughs> instead of sleeping in the truck, which was, it was eight degrees in um, the lower part of Ohio at this time, because okay. the lower part of Ohio is very close to Kentucky and mm -hmm. it does get, exceptionally cold. Well, it gets exceptionally cold in Northern yeah. Ohio as well. Um, so yeah, they, they, they um, slip in the jailhouse, um, which um, every time I hear the story, I'm like, how do you deal with those kinds of situations? And um, yeah. quite frankly, uh, Willie Thomas has said on several occasions, he would, um, and he was alone. And, and as a bull rider, you can do a lot more rodeos because you don't have to, um, carry your horse with you if you're yeah. in some of the timed events, mm -hmm. nor do you have to carry the saddle and all those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. you, you've got some riggings, but yeah. um, that can be um, handled. And you know, cowboys said, are very, very tough and stoic people just by yes. the nature of 
the job and the activities that they endure. And I think that carries over to their character. And so when you talk about how does he deal with a situation like that, I think he was already like an innate tough guy, just being a cowboy. Well, yeah, and, and, and for him, having worked on the rodeo, you know, hardships, you know, was, you know, second nature, but dealing with some of the things that um, other individuals did not have to deal with mm -hmm. still um, takes its toll, much like Jackie Robinson going alone, you know, uh, in several places and not being able to stay with his um, teammates, but really was on the road by himself. And, and at times they would not allow him to actually stay in a hotel. He remembers a time in which they didn't allow him to stay in a hotel. So he went to the park and, and was sleeping on a park bench mm -hmm. until um, the police came and said, you can't you know, sleep here, this, that, and the other. So he walked over to the rodeo arena, climbed the fence and slept on the bleachers mm -hmm. until the um, venue opened up and um, he was able to compete yeah, competing under those kinds of circumstances yeah. are obviously not the ideal. There were times where he was um, among those to compete and they wouldn't let him in the front gate. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, he at one time had them call the head uh, of um, the RCA at the time, which was the Rodeo Cowboys Association. Now it's the Professional Rodeo Cowboys PRCA. What he had them call um, this individual who said, you're, you're talking about Willie Thomas, you know, let him ride. He is a bull rider and should be able to ride regardless of what you guys are doing down there. Yeah. And, and Murtis Dykeman incurred some of the same kinds of things throughout the 60s and into the 70s. As a matter of fact, in, um, Where is he at? Uh, I'm trying to think of where he's from. Uh, Murtis Dykeman uh, has an annual rodeo in Crockett, Texas. And at the um, Civic Center um, in Crockett, Texas, there is a bust of um, this hometown hero who has um, put Crockett, Texas on the map. And for the last 30 years, he's held a rodeo um, in Crockett that supports a number of charities. Um, he is still alive and well, and um, is one of those individuals that um, has been elected into the Pro Rodeo Hall of Fame in Oklahoma City, as well as um, Colorado Springs, Colorado. I've been there, it's really cool. <laughs> yeah, um, great place, uh, great place. Um, can you talk a little bit about kind of like the history of where rodeos came from? I know it's an American invention and creation. Well, I, actually- Or is it more Mexican? It, it, it's actually uh, Mexican. It comes okay. from the Mexican fiestas, actually. Okay. And um, it's been anglicized, anglicized. As a matter of fact, um, rodeo would not call it, it was called rodeo. Rodeo. Um, and and, and been, be, became anglicized in, um, very little credit is, is given to um, the um, Mexican uh, rodeo, if you will, for having um, put this um, sport. <laughs> yeah, um, I'd like to say quasi sport form because it wasn't a, a sport form at that time, but it morphed into one. Yeah. And it was primarily a celebration of the roundup, the rounding up of uh, Mustang horses and the branding and other kinds of things. And, and we get the cowboys uh, in many respects from the Baqueros who um, did their ranching and, and, and did their um, bringing cattle together on horseback because right. African-Americans have been involved in herding for thousands of years in Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, it was when they were brought to this country unceremoniously, I might add, whether it was in South America or North America, but in Mexico and, and, and in the South America where um, Mexicans um, did their ranching on horseback. 
which um, they were able, African Americans were able to pick up these um, skills through these the Bikeros uh, and these individuals who were able to um, do their cattle ranching um, on horseback with various kinds of tools that whether it would be um, a lasso or whether it spurs come from uh, uh, Mexicans mm -hmm. um, and a number of the tools that we associate with um, ranching actually comes from Spanish Texas. Right. And as I mentioned, um, and, and, and certainly um, few people are aware of the fact that um, slavery was abolished um, in Mexico um, prior to 1824, but through Vincente Guerrero, who was a, a black Indian, who was the first, uh, he was the first black Indian president mm -hmm. of the Republic of Mexico, and I believe their second president. Um, he outlawed um, slavery. Um, unfortunately, there were individuals who um, opted to continue with slavery and um, various individuals, even though it had been outlawed, unfortunately, Vincente Guerrero was um, put to death as a result of some of his policies, but some consider him um, one of the greatest individuals of color of Mexico because of his liberating uh, policies um, and, and, and other kinds of things whether it was education, whether it was governance, um, he, he stood out mm -hmm. among those who um, have been involved in Mexican politics over the years. Um, but we would see um, the legacy mm -hmm. of uh, African-Americans involved in the livestock management business um, as Texas would grow Mm -hmm. And um, the, the Mexican government was, was really um, instrumental in um, the livestock management business because they wanted to um, settle a lot of parts of the Mexican territory so that the French and others could not come into these lands. And one of the ways they were doing this was by um, developing various settlements and outposts as far as East Texas was part mm -hmm. of Mexican territory. Mm -hmm. um, we would see African-Americans involved in the development of these areas. So when we talk about African-Americans on the Western frontier and on the plains, it supersedes the Buffalo soldiers who made um, the plane safe for many um, individuals who came from the north, from the from the east, and, and mm -hmm. settled in places like Oklahoma and Kansas and, and Texas, uh, Missouri and the like. Certainly, uh, Buffalo soldiers who were um, actually um, at uh, Fort Pachuca in Arizona. Um, and, and unfortunately, um, they were tasked with um, what some people refer to as taming the West, which you know had something to do with exterminating the native population. Mm -hmm. um, but they took on many roles, and I'm referring to African Americans on the Western uh, Plains. Yeah, um, you have people like. Um, Stagecoach Mary, who ran the stagecoach. You had individuals who were of color who um, were running the Pony Express. Um, you had um, someone Nate Love. like, well, Nat Love, but Nat Love. even uh, more important, I would say, than Nat Love is Bass Reeves. Who is Bass that? Reeves was um, a um, lawman. Uh, sheriff, um, who um, his legacy has been written by Art Burton in several books, 
And um, he um, was involved in the Oklahoma Territory in many respects and went far and wide in disguises and what have you mm -hmm. as a beggar, as a tramp, as a drunker in an effort to bring back some of these felons. And there's a story where um, one individual um, knew that um, he was being hunted down, but um, was not aware that it was Bass Reeves that was um, after him. And um, he was told uh, where he was bedding down one night that um, Bass Reeves was on his trail. Mm -hmm. And this individual got so nervous and, and, and so panicked by the fact that Bass Reeves was on his trail that he turned himself in to the sheriff hmm. because this guy was so legendary. Some contend that the Lone Ranger with, uh, with Clayton Moore was actually supposed to be Bass Reeves. Huh. But we know that several characters that have been depicted in film who are actually Black um, were played by white characters mm -hmm. Um, in some of these um, films. And, and, and we know of mountain men who uh, were black, who um, did their work in the Sierra Nevadas. Um, and just the, the, the West was uh, multicultural. Yeah. Um, some contend that uh, over 25% uh, of mm -hmm. the Western frontier was of blacks and a third of it was of color, Native American, Mexican, mm -hmm. and, and, and African Americans. So unlike the homogeneous um, setting that we see in many Western films, that was not the real um, American West. The right. American West, because think about it, if you will, if you have um, a rancher, which has a large spread of, of cattle, um, uh, horses, you know, and, and other livestock. And it's cold, wintry, it could be damp, it could just be nasty outside. He wasn't going to send his son to go pick up those wayward animals. He was going to oftentimes have the individual who may have been the lowest on the totem pole or on the hierarchy, mm -hmm. if you will. And I was going to be a black cowboy. And black cowboys that I've asked, as a matter of fact, this is what one of them who was a working cowboy said, he said, do you think that rancher was going to send his son or, or someone close to him out there? No, he was going to send a cowboy, a boy who mm -hmm. oftentimes they were calling blacks boys at that time, regardless of how old they were out. To... That was a that was something I was reading about the origins of the term cowboy. They would use cow hand, excuse me, cow hand for the white counter cowboys, yes. and then the pejorative term cowboy, which is now the accepted term. Everybody's a cowboy. Yes, and, and a number of individuals um, for a long period of time did not want to be associated or called a cowboy because well, oftentimes we... that was indicative of a black individual who was tending to cows. Right. So when did that, you think that changed when it was less derogatory? Um, I, I don't know the exact but date. Come with the American in my book, films? I actually kind of talk about that. And, and there are several um, statements made about, you know, where the term comes from or like, I, I, I kind of steer clear because there are many individuals and, and many takes on how that term, but I mean, we do know that uh, blacks were called boys, whether it was a field boy, house boy, cowboy, cowboy. That individual. So that yeah. was it. it. It became a bit fashionable. Um, I would probably say 1860s or, 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 or 1850s, thereabout. Um, Post Civil we, War. We do know is that white cowboys, they might have been called, um, as you said, ranchers, cow, or hand. cow hands. There were other terms used um, for them. And, and it's an interesting, interesting, um, what should I say, um, 
kind of an oxymoron because we do know it was a discriminatory, segregated environment in many respects. But out on the trail, these individuals coexisted. They, they kind of ate together. Mm -hmm. um, they they kind of lived together. They kind of sang around, you know, some of these campfires and the like. It, it was, as many have said, a less discriminatory environment until they went into town. Mm -hmm. And um, when they went into town, we would see those barriers come up very often. Mm -hmm. But on the trail, it was, hey, can you do the work? Can yeah. you do? And, and many Blacks wanted to work on these cattle drives, and they were part mm -hmm. of the largest cattle drives in history. What percentage of Black cowboys were a part of the cattle drives? What percentage of them? Oh, um, oftentimes there could be as many as half of those individuals on a cattle drive could be Black. Blacks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they could be Mexican, but they would rare, they would never be the, the, the cattle boss. They would never be the individual who um, was um, in charge in charge of anything. Yeah. Now, one individual that um, comes to mind, and he's in the Hall of Fame uh, and the Walk of Fame up in Fort Worth. And by the way, if you ever go to Cowtown in Fort Worth, <laughs> it's worth visiting the various museums they have. But in front of the Cowtown Coliseum is actually the statue of Bill Pickett steer wrestling. And um, that is um, something they covet and, and make big ado over because of He's the notoriety Texas, right? of Bill Pickett. Bill Pickett's from Texas, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He's from uh, what they call Taylor, Texas. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, the cattle drives um, were, were interesting in and of themselves. And John Ware, is a notable figure because he's perceived as the father of cattle drives, something of that nature in Alberta, Canada, because he's the first to have driven cattle all the way to Alberta, Canada. Wow. So he's a legendary figure, um, literally in Canada. And um, they have a plaque honoring uh, John Ware in what year the, was that? Um, Hall of Fame in um, Fort Worth, Texas. What What year was that when John Weir um, made that cattle oh, drive? I can't remember offhand, but I also mentioned him in the book also okay. because he is such uh, an important figure yeah. uh, as it relates to cattle drives. Because yeah. Texas was the purveyor of, of cattle basically um, throughout the United States. Uh, they would take them to the railheads in places like in Kansas mm -hmm. and, and, and Dodge City and places mm -hmm. like that and ship them up to the slaughterhouses in Chicago by rail. But the, these cattle drives had to get them up to these rail, what they call railheads. They mm -hmm. were actually, you know, the place where um, the uh, railroad came in mm -hmm. uh, until railroads started to cross um, east and west, and, and, and barbed wire started to come about. That ended basically the cattle drives and, and, and started to close off the Western frontier. Mm -hmm. So many of the individuals who would uh, have been um, cattle herders uh, on the cattle drives and what have you went to the ranches to work. Mm -hmm. And there weren't as many opportunities mm -hmm. on the ranches as there yeah. were on the cattle drive. So it would kind of bring to an end the uh, major cattle drives. But um, they would still be on some of the ranches um, mm -hmm. in and around Texas and Oklahoma. And as a result of this, we would see from these ranches individuals wanting to compete in some sort of quasi sport or athletic kind of activity, hence rodeo. And yeah. um, there would be an individual who said, well, I have um, an individual who can ride 
a bull or a brock. And, 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 and let's be clear, there is nothing in ranching that requires an individual to get on a bull. That is purely an invention, okay? Um, uh, in terms of uh, bareback riding, yeah, you, 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 you um, have to um, break horses. Yeah. And, and many uh, Blacks were involved. As a matter of fact, that's the, uh, uh, a business that Bill Pickett and his brothers um, put together mm -hmm. early in the, in the 1920s and thereabout. They had a um, company that broke horses mm -hmm. and uh, made a considerable amount of money as a result of that. Did you know, I mean, you probably know this, but Bill Pickett actually died when a bronc hit him in the head. Yes. And he was yeah. like 61. So it's a very yeah. dangerous to be a cowboy. Obviously, there's lots of injuries and it's a high risk profession. Well, uh, rodeo is certainly um, a high risk um, uh, business. It's an um, expensive hobby and vocation for those who have the wherewithal. and and. Ironically, many of the individuals who are actually full-time rodeo cowboys are not affiliated with ranching. Many of them don't know how to ranch. Mm -hmm. um, so as um, Cleo Hearn, who's known throughout the state of Texas as um, Mr. Black Rodeo, said there are three kinds of cowboys. There is the urban cowboy, you know, the individual who likes to dress in Western wear and what have you. There is the working cowboy who works on the ranch and knows how to do the various things related to ranching. And then there's the rodeo cowboy who is basically, and, and, and I've written an article years ago um, indicating that um, this is, um, an athlete, an entrepreneur, and an entertainer. Mm -hmm. he, he's all of those things. Yes. Um, and actually, he is a social icon. He, the, the rodeo cowboys are icons in many respects. Yeah. They dress in certain attire. And the rules of rodeo require you to dress in a certain way. They all have to have, in competition, long sleeve shirts on. Mm -hmm. um, Nowadays, now they have helmets. <laughs> uh, yeah, and, and for a long period of time, individuals talk badly about those who wore helmets. Mm. Much like um, hockey players, when they introduced helmets, the early hockey players did not wear helmets. And they thought that was um, not cool. And they yeah. thought that was, unfortunately, uh, uh, I'm going to say this, uncomplimentary as feminine. Okay. Wow. Um, because individuals were wearing helmets. Okay. Mm. Now um, they're all, in many respects, wearing helmets. You, you rarely see individuals going with just the cowboy hat. And, and many were of the opinion that the cowboy hat is protective gear, which we know is not, even though some tried to do it with air and, and, and water and things of that nature. Um, but the same was um, said with regard to the Kevlar vests, which all of them, you know, and certainly bull riders wear now. Mm -hmm. um, but it wasn't until the Kevlar vest was made into a vest where he had that Western flair, mm -hmm. okay, that individuals wanted to don that protective equipment. But if you look at early rodeo contestants, whether it's 50s, 60s, 70s, yeah. and maybe even in the 80s, you're not yeah. going to see that Kevlar vest. Yeah. You know, they were going without, but that protects the ribs. Right. You know, if you um, get buck or what they say, have a wreck, that bull yeah. can hit you in the ribs and it breaks ribs along with other parts of the body and all of them yeah. have had broken bones. It, 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 that, that goes along with the territory much like the individual who um, got me started with rodeo, um, a full professor in the sociology department by the name of C. Allen Haney, who unfortunately has, has passed. 
But um, he mentions that, you know, just like anybody who rides a motorcycle, you're going to fall at some point in time. Mm -hmm. And you do need a helmet. You do need the protective equipment. That's going to happen with every yeah. rodeo cowboy. They're going to break bones. And it's just a matter of what bone it is and how many and how often. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, the new millennium? What can we expect or see in the future and so on? Yeah, the new millennium is another area that um, I talk about. I, I call them new jack cowboys, so to speak, because they are a little different yeah. than um, those of the past. We will see some of the um, rodeo cowboys, regardless of race, color, ethnicity. But um, when I talk about black cowboys, and, and this goes probably for some of the white ones, they may get up on um, their horses and they may have their cell phones on. They may have, they may be plugged into uh, whatever music they listen to on horseback. Mm -hmm. um, the um, contemporary black cowboy um, may not have um, the um, what I call the Jack Johnson haircut, but some of them are going to have a bald head now. They've gotten rid of the Jerry Curl or the Afro or what have you. Um, it, it's um, a, a bit different they can now participate in rodeo that their forefathers were not able to participate in. Um, many of them travel now um, with the long trailers that they can have their horses and their lodging in. Mm -hmm. um, they will have these big doolies. I mean, these are 3,500 Ram trucks that cost incredible amounts of money. Yeah. Um, to travel and, and do the kinds of things that um, Black cowboys in particular were not able to do um, in the past. Um, they compete. And now the competition, when you go to register, it's not oftentimes the open rodeos like what I've referred to as um, the individuals called shadow riders of the subterranean circuit. And, and you've seen that term before, or you've seen the term that um, Wendy Waitress used as the soul circuit. These were black rodeos that um, were scheduled throughout the year with little or no fanfare in small rural environs with no media, um, little to no media, certainly broadcast media or- um, And it was just all for black cowboys, no other- Well, it was open rodeos. Anyone could participate, okay. but oftentimes, you know, white cowboys didn't choose to participate with black cowboys because they could participate in any rodeo that they right. chose to. Right. I've referred to them as um, the soul, uh, I refer to them uh, I refer to them as the subterranean circuit. Okay. Shadow riders of the subterranean circuit refers to black cowboys who rodeoed in the shadows of their white counterparts yeah. in rodeos that were off the beaten path, subterranean, underground rodeos that yeah. begun. Th th these rodeos started as early as the 1940s. And, yeah. and, and go all the way up into current times. And uh, they have a schedule and, and the individuals who participate know the various events and the, know the various schedules of these rodeos. And for these small rural towns, and I'm referring to places like Macbeth, Raywood, um, Liberty, uh, West Columbia, I mean, there were black rodeo arenas here in Texas, one called the Diamond Ale, um, where, and in Kendleton, Kendleton was a black town. Um, and they would have a rodeo there and it would bring the community together. It was like having um, the, the county fair. And it was a place, it was what 
many refer to as safe space for individuals where some of your politicians could um, come out and talk with individuals about what's going on in the community. It would be an opportunity for uh, vendors to sell their wares. It would be an opportunity for people to see some of these legendary cowboys mm -hmm. um, in action and, and, and some of the best actually in the world were competing much like in Negro League, in the Negro League, some of the best ball players in the world were playing in the Negro Leagues. Mm -hmm. I mean, we know about Jackie Robinson, but Jackie Robinson was not one of the best mm -hmm. of the players in the Negro Leagues. I mean, he was chosen by Branch Rickey because he was college educated, a multi-sport individual. As a matter of fact, baseball was not his best sport. He was a better was. golfer, a better football player. As a matter of fact, he played football at um, UCLA with two individuals who integrated the uh, National Football League. One was Woody Strode, who uh, became an actor and was in a lot of the early Tarzan movies. Another one was um, uh, Washington, uh, Kenny Washington, who would have been the first Heisman Trophy winner, but they didn't name the Heisman Trophy at that time, which was the best college football player. It was mm -hmm. called the double, Douglas Fairbanks Jr. Uh, 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 Douglas Fairbanks uh, Award at that time, which, um, and he played with these individuals at UCLA. So that's why Branch Rickey chose him. Yeah. But um, there were many stellar baseball players. That does not yeah. take anything away from Jackie Robinson right. because he was an exceptional ball players in spite of the circumstances yeah. that he had to deal with. But yeah. just, many just of these like rodeo, the black rodeo cowboys were involved in the same kinds of things. They were participating in these small um, rural rodeos with yeah. you know, the, the deep, what I call the devotees. These were individuals that followed them from place to place as well until these individuals went to some of these larger rodeos. And even at the Houston Livestock Show and Rodeo, at one time, um, Blacks could only attend the rodeo on Tuesday, a certain day of the week. And um, individuals could only compete on a certain day of the week. Here this in, is the Houston in, Rodeo up until when? Oh, uh, we would see that probably, and I don't know exactly, but it would probably have to be somewhere around um, early, 1970s and probably in, in, in early 70s, very, very early 70s, or late 60s, early 70s, because we know that um, case in point, Major League Baseball was not fully integrated until the 1960s. Um, the Boston Red Sox was the last team to integrate Major okay. League Baseball. So even though Jackie Robinson integrated Major League Baseball in 48, it took over a decade for the Major League Baseball to be fully integrated. Mm -hmm. And such was the case with many of these rodeo venues mm -hmm. um, where you know, even though um, there had been legislation banning discrimination mm -hmm. and sanctioned um, segregation, once again, we're dealing with individuals who, are, you know, some of them are in these small rural communities and you know, they run it by their own rules. And yeah. even though uh, it was against the law, they may have prohibiting um, circumstances uh, in place, um, whether it was a slack or um, where an individual could ride but could not pick up their winnings. They'd have to send someone in to pick up their winnings. Wow. Um, well, I know we're getting close on time and uh, just, is there anything else you would like to add pertinent to this topic? Uh, let me see, because I tried to jot down a note or two. Um, it's been very, very helpful. You know, I think a lot of people don't realize the amount of contributions that the Black Cowboy has done throughout pre-Civil War, post-Civil War, throughout, the, you know, the 20th century. Um, and a lot of times they're invisible as we have seen in the history. Yeah, and, and, and that's uh, the point that um, is so disturbing that they were there, but somehow they got whitewashed or they were totally 
omitted, blatantly omitted, I might say, as if they did not exist. And they were there the whole yeah. time yeah. Um, in the opening of the West. Yeah. Um, even with the Houston Livestock Show and Rodeo, we see the Prairie View Trail Riders Association um, as one of the signature um, trail riding groups that um, come into town during the annual parade. But that was difficult for him, for them because they traditionally um, come into um, the park and I can't think of the name of it offhand, but they come into town, but uh, for many years, they were not able to um, camp at the same site as um, the other individuals coming in, but they've been involved with the rodeo um, since the 1950s and have carved out a niche to a point where they're among the first mm -hmm. that come into town every year when they have the Houston Livestock Show and Rodeo. And that's partly due to Murtis Dykeman and James Francis, who were the architects of the Prairie View Trail Riders Association, mm -hmm. as well as um, um, some of the individuals who helped um, fund the organization. So um, we owe um, a lot to the Black Cowboy and, and those who um, stuck it out and um, helped Texas really become the place that we all associate with cattle raising, barbecue, and the many Yo. things <laughs> that we associate with um, Western culture. Yes. And, and still in all, there are more cowboys in Texas than any other place in the world. And there are more black cowboys in the state of Texas than any other place in mm -hmm. the world. Yes. So um, we are in a, a wonderful place to be involved in Western culture. And that's one of the reasons why I got involved with it because what better place to do research and particularly on um, the etiology of the black cowboy and the black rodeo cowboy than in the state of Texas and Fort Bend and, and the Houston metropolitan area. Yes, yes. Okay, last question. Have you ever rode a bull? No, and, and I, I don't intend to. <laughs> Not even mechanical? Um, I have ridden a horse before but there is nothing um, I need to do on the bull. The best, the closest I've ever gotten to a, a bull was in the shoots at the Houston Livestock Show and Rodeo when I was covering the Houston Livestock Show and Rodeo and doing research. I was in the chute and um, the bull was snorting and doing all those kinds of things. No, um, that would be foolhardy for me as a researcher to, to be involved in something like that. I, I do uh, better work watching and recording than uh, actually participating. This is purely um, what do we call um, non-participant observation. Nice, nice. Well, thank you, Dr. Pearson. This has been a really interesting uh, discussion. And if you guys like this video, please uh, give it a thumbs up and leave a comment below in the description box. Well, I'm giving it a thumbs up right now. And I do double appreciate thumbs. Yeah, double <laughs> thumbs up. I wish I had more. Um, <laughs> I appreciate you. the time and um, your willingness to um, listen to me ramble about what I've been involved in over the last 20 some odd years because it's been interesting and it's been historical for me. Yes, yes. And I, and I appreciate your work and what you are doing. And I hope those that are watching also um, got something out of this and that we remember our history about this. And so thank you again for watching. Thanks, Dr. Pearson. Thank you. Have a good day. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.